Let me welcome you all. As Mr. Dorsey said, my name is Professor Schimmel. I'm here today just to give you, I would say, a talk of about 30, 35 minutes. And it's basically about the idea how what manliness or masculinity meant really changed quite dramatically at the beginning of the 20th century. And I usually give about an hour and a half talk on this in my regular 1302 class. For this one here, yes, there's somebody who I would say maybe about four weeks ago heard the full story here. <laughs> you will get the abbreviated version. And now what I've done is, yes, go ahead, David. Are you, are you showing the football video? I will show the football video. Yes, if you like football, like you know, I've got something for you in this class. But what I've added is also is a bit of a comparison. Because usually why to talk about salinity, whenever it happens in time, meaning you have a lecture from the 19th century, I find the 20th. And so what's new is I've added a bit of the 19th century here as well. So that basically you get a good contrast here as well. And some of you now, who have taken me before, they will find this next slide here very, very familiar. For those of you who don't, what I always do is usually in the beginning to start discussion in my class right away, I show students four images. And the idea is basically I want to show you what are the key themes of this class, right? What are the big topics here? And it's a good way right, to get students active right from get-go. And I think this one here probably will create a response among you very, very quickly. Tell me what you see in the one top left. You would feel all over again. Yes. Okay, right. You Basically, have a bigger elephant gun, man. You, you are impressed by how small the rifle is. No, no, I'm disappointed. You're disappointed. Okay, but <laughs> see what the idea is that you bring up size here is actually very interesting, right? Because you can tell this picture is choreographed, right? If you think about like you know how the elephant is dying here, how Roosevelt is standing, right? This is done for effect. And tell me, what are you supposed to take away from looking at that picture? Dominance. Good. Right? And how is it? Think about this. Think about his size. Think about the size of the animal. Right? What do you see almost immediately? I'm seeing the elephant doesn't look to be injured, at least on this side. So, so it's an establishment dominance. Like, ah, I can do this without making it look any worse. Although I've got to tell you, this man based in his career in the military probably didn't worry too much about blood or guts. <laughs> but the idea is what you point to is the exact right thing. Right? And that is basically, he looks... Very, very small, right? And the elephant looks absolutely massive. So when you look at this, right, what do you take away from this? What's the immediate response you have to this picture? That you don't have to be a famous talking glass. You don't have to be a very <coughs> tall or masculine guy to take, take down the animal like that. Yes, good, right? It's the size comparison. Yeah, I was going to say, like, on, on, like, just looking at it, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm, right? I think you basically ask yourself, how can a human being, right, that small by comparison, take down an animal of that size? And well, what's the answer? You must be a strong, tough guy, right, mm -hmm. to be able to get this done. Now, of course, I think by mistake, I already gave you the answer, because I told you who that is. But for those of you who don't know, who is that man? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That is actually the American president. And now ask yourself. Why would the American president, by this point in time, not yet the most powerful man on the planet, but most certainly very powerful, why would he want you to see that picture? He's the bull moose. I mean, he's Roosevelt, you know, he's Correct. supposed to be, he wants everyone to see him as active. And this is important, manhood. right? Because he wants to say, this is what manhood really is about. And as you will see, actually, in the 20th century, this is new. Hmm. And note, he does this for a purpose. Because Roosevelt was concerned about the state of American men. As you will see in a bit, he actually wrote a famous essay called The Strength in US Life. And he said he was worried about American men losing their virility and their masculinity as well. And he thought about ways, right, perhaps, how we can recapture it. And one thing he thought was a good way of doing it was this. <laughs> tell me about the second image. Football. That is football, right? But probably, as you can tell right away, this is. Early early football. Give me one or two examples how you can tell, well, that's not the today stuff. Helmets. Would you even call those things helmets? <laughs> right? If you look at this, it's, it's like a leather cap here. Look at the padding, no real shoulder pads here, right? No, they're, it's, they're not very big, like those By comparison, the answer is yes, right? If you look at this note, most of the players at that point in time, they don't even lift weights, right? This is natural strength. 
You just try to pick the guys who are really naturally really, really strong. And that means some of those guys are not massively big. Because keep in mind, right, some people like you just have natural strength and you do not have the broader shoulders that you must have. But now if you look at this, let me give you one statistic. What do you think is the highest number of players dying in one college season? And this is college football. I am going to keep my mouth. You know, but you're not going to tell anybody else. <laughs> I'm going to get taken in this semester. Was it, I know that. You said in one semester? In one, in one season. But yeah, it would be one semester. Okay. Um, let's say 15? 15 go higher. Damn. Who has more? 100. Too high. 28. Thank you. That's close. It's actually 32. Mm. 32 players died in one season. Indeed, this game is so violent that this one over here said, maybe we have to rein this in <laughs> and make this a little less brutal. But ask yourself, and I'm sure most of you know this, at what schools does college football actually become popular? Ivy, Ivy Leagues. Who goes there? Rich ones. Rich white people. Exactly. So ask yourself. Today we would call these guys trust fund babies, right? <laughs> these guys have everything going for themselves. They have not a worry in their life, but they play a game which they can reasonably expect to die on the field. Why? Maybe it's this real or? Yeah. Okay, right? You see, there's a connection between those two things. And in this case, what I want you to see is that that idea here that starts all the way on top of society, right? That somehow American chained men must refine their masculinity, right? How that eventually fizzles down here, right? Two, but at the time still, are oftentimes fairly elite players, right? The people who play early on the Ivy Leagues are rich by background. And that means it tells us slowly, this filters down. Ask yourself about the audience. Who goes to attend these games? Everyone else. Right? Could be rich people, could be alumni. But how about the ordinary people from the neighborhood? Will they come? Yeah. Yeah. Says yes. So what happens here? President, elite, and the spectators are really more ordinary people. So what does this tell us here about this definition of masculinity? It has to do with physical fitness, with aggression and bravado. What is happening here? It is slowly trickling down right from top of society to all their people as well. And that's one thing I want to explain to you today. How in some ways here, right? A redefinition happened because, well, compares to the 19th century. I picked two images here. I think they will bring out the contrast very nicely. This one here, I mean, it's almost like a stereotype. But explain it to you. First one on the bottom, what do you see? Wife getting the table ready? Correct, right? She's basically setting everything up. She clearly is <laughs> a classical housewife. And what is he doing? He's, He's standing there basically doing nothing to help. <laughs> and he reads the paper. And let me tell you, when you look back at this, we call this separate spheres. The idea was that they changed. Many people thought, you know what? Men and women have complementary roles, but they should not intersect or overlap, right? He might be doing the work. She wants the house. He might be in association while trying to make life better. She instills good morals in the kids, right? Both do their part to make society good, but these roles hardly ever overlap, right? They're separate, hence separate spheres. And in this idea, right? Well, look at this. What is it that is considered manly? Look at the second image. What is it that he does that makes him a man? Ah, he's doing the work, he's the breadwinner, he makes money. If you would have said to me in 1860, before this takes place, you right, that being a strong guy playing sport makes you manly. <laughs> there were many guys in response would have said, that's a waste of my time. My job is to provide for my family. That is what makes you manly. And so you look at this, do you see a shift here, right? Our definition of what makes you man is changing, and it's changing quite rapidly. And in some ways here, where that shift is coming from, and then of course also, right, what does it mean for people? Was it a complete shift? Or in some ways, right? Both images still stick with us today as well. That's what I want us to discuss. discuss. But the end of this is over. Questions? Before I flip forward, right away. Any questions that you have? Then let's go with the first one. So in this case here, remember I said that Roosevelt basically was trying to push this new image of masculinity. Where is it coming from? Think about this practically. 1890s, 1900, right? That means industrialization has really spread rapidly in the United States. And that meant 
If in 1870 I asked you, who is the average American? You would have said, that person is a farmer. How about the 1880s or 90s? African worker. Perfect. All right. By that point in time, it's an industrial society. You, as an ordinary American, are either working in a factory or you're a family member, right, of somebody who is. Now think about this. If you are working in the fields, what does your body look like? Pretty jacked. Pretty jacked, right? Broad shoulders, thick arms. You probably are in decent shape. Mm -hmm. Now remember, factory work creates two types of jobs. There's the guy at the machine, and there's the guy who orders the supplies. Starts is the guy who orders supplies and sits in a chair 10 hours a day. What is going to happen to your belly? <laughs> that will grow very quickly. Posture? So, imagine now, like, you know, when the guy who works in the chair looks at the guy who works in the fields. What will you notice rather like, quickly? <laughs> right? The idea is maybe like in some ways you feel that I'm not as strong as I used to be. Think about the guy who's doing the machine, right? Oftentimes, actually, machine work is strenuous, but it is one repetitive motion over and over again. What does this do to your body? Unproportional, maybe? Yeah. Ever seen someone who throws the javelin? Mm -hmm. Like one side, one biceps is just huge, and the other side, you're like, are you even working out? <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's the idea. And that means when these guys look at each other, right, you can actually see just by the way the economy changes. Are also the physique of man was changing. And Roosevelt, one of the people who noticed. And now remember, the man is the president. Oh, I put it up here so I don't even get to ask you because they have the answer. Here. Now ask yourself why is the president concerned about the shape of men? Huh? What happens, let's say, when you go to war against a country that is still strongly involved in agriculture, right? What kind of man would meet there in the field? Perfect, right? And that means that guy is getting very young. And so, trust me, I'm not saying the American men have gone soft, but the fear was there, right? Roosevelt feared that perhaps I wouldn't be able to field a strong army that would be able to compete in the field. And that meant he penned an essay here, very famous indeed, it's so famous. If you look at this, I picked this image here of a biography of his. And here the author thought that article was so important, she said, that's what I will name as the title of my book because it expresses so nicely what his life was all about. Yeah. Yeah. In addition to that, America, as opposed to other industrial countries during that, during that period, they had uh, compulsory military service for all men. So more or less the military would be certain that they could beat the men into shape during the compulsory service period. But America didn't do that. Our army was tiny. Mm -hmm. So that the government didn't have a way of, I guess you say, keeping the men at par. Mm -hmm. Right? And so in this case now, if you look at Roosevelt here, right, in some ways, well, he worries ultimately the United States is a new coming country, remember? It's founded very late. It's still sort of trying to establish its place on the planet. And it competes with European countries. And that means the man gets worried. So what's his response? He says, well, look, if you can't get your strength anymore from working in the fields, maybe there are other avenues, right? How you can recreate your strength. And without having ever read the piece, what do you think was his answer? Right? Make yourself living the strenuous life outside of work. So what do you do? How do you do it? What the hell? Yeah. Right? For instance, later on you will see how they shoot your first famous bodybuilder in the United States. Lifting weights. Mm -hmm. Riding your bicycle. Right? All of these things now are seen as ways outside of work to kind of rebuild your strength and you rebuild your masculinity. And that now of course meant in order for this to succeed, Roosevelt has to persuade, right, as you said, a large section of population, right, if this is supposed to help them create a strong army, they must all now begin to strive as a deal and follow up for this to work. And that means now we have avenues to trace how this new idea of masculinity, right, strength, physicality, aggression, bravado, how this now slowly spreads to society. And here, I want to start this example of football because let's think about this. If the president is already on top, one layer down would be the upper class, right? Again, those would be the folks who go to Ivy League schools. And now, I couldn't find a good video from the 1890s, for instance. But you probably do know, of course, right? The first which we have here is from 1905, so it's still fairly close. And I can assure you, football hasn't changed that much. What you will see here is fairly close to the way the game would have looked in the 1880s and 90s as well. 
And so this is now from the Big Ten. This is Michigan against Chicago. But I think you will get a sense very quickly of what the game looked like. Here where it says Q, a few things for you to look out for. When you watch the video, first you will see the guy posing. Ask yourself about the posture, right? What kind of message are they trying to send in the way they stay? Think about the strategy. How is this game being played? You will see one guy being carried off. Ask yourself what has happened to him. And then you will see a few shots of the background as well and the audio. Ask yourself, how much of the game can they see? What do you think they came to see? But a few questions to keep in mind while you watch this. Let me play it for you and then we'll talk about it. And that is how you have to imagine early football. So let's think about this. First thing is why you saw these guys standing there, note, they are not facing the other players. They are facing the audience. Why are they doing that? I know you know because you've taken my class. Let me see who else. Why do you think they are doing this? Why are they pausing for the audience? They're not worried about their Google, their friends necessarily. They're worried about the other people who are out there. Right? They are trying to project an image. And what is this image? What do they want everyone in the audience to know about them? Correct, right? Note, they don't have the helmets on, right? They want to be seen, and clearly, right, in some ways, how powerful they are, how strong they are, right? They want everyone to know that I am courageous enough to play a game in which I might die. And now look at me and how strong I am, right? And clearly, this posing for the audience, it tells you how important this need is to them. Then you saw the game. You want to play this game? For those of you who like to watch football today, is that an appealing game? It's Correct. Well, actually, by comparison today, it looks pretty boring. Because it's a running play after running play after running play. And do you know why that is? The forward pass is still illegal. And now think about this. Imagine if you coach the defense here, right? And you know it's a running play on every single down. What do you do? Everybody on the line. Correct, right? You stack the line. And that means for every single player on every single play, what happens? Correct. You will have a full-on collision because you know what? You're not going to fake out anybody. You know what's coming. And 
Look at the padding. If you know what's coming and you defend it basically by running straight in the guy, you have little padding. What's the result going to be? Right? You will see injuries. And I know the quality isn't great, but could you see how the guy was being carried off in the end? What do you think happened to him? Right? Could be. I mean, I'm not sure personally, but I thought that he couldn't put weight on either leg. And that probably means he had both legs broken at the same time, or more likely, right, something lower back, spinal injury. And that means perhaps the guy was paralyzed for the rest of his life. And I think, right, it gives you a sense of how violent the game is because you have full speed collisions every single time, a load, many ways to tackle that we wouldn't use today are still legal. Hint, close line, mm -hmm. right? Because remember, if you don't have padding, of course you risk being injured yourself when you tackle. And that means you're trying to tackle without using too much of your body. And that means, right, the arm, for instance, is a good way to get somebody else down. And now think about this. That is a pretty violent game. And you have guys playing it here, right? Who perhaps today we would call millionaires. Do you think they have become convinced that this was really something that's important for them? So important they're willing to die for it? Absolutely. Go forward to the audience. Imagine if you see a football game without the forward pass. How much of the game do you actually see? What do you see? Right? You have 20 people basically jumping on top of each other. Do you think they came to watch the game? No, they came to watch somebody get hit. Okay, why did it be NASCAR? The idea is you come and watch the show, well, you see the crash. But think about this. Is this the only thing? Or what else? Why else might you be there? What happens to you right when you in this case see support a team in this very, very rough game? Think about maybe the older man. Let's say you're like me, you're in your mid-40s. And you go out there, right, and you are the biggest fan, you got the flag and everything, and you wait for your team. Can you think of any other reason why the older man might go through this too? Right? Think about this. Maybe you say, oh, I'm too old to play, right? Mm -hmm. But how kind of can you connect yourself to this new masculinity as well? Support it. Correct, right? Think about this today. Yeah? I would also say uh, tradition. Mm -hmm. in the sense, uh, like hand it down. Like we left the game, now you leave it like we left it. Oh, we're coming to see if you're leaving it like Exactly, it. right? Zamis, you're trying to reconnect. You said, I used to play, and now what you play. And I will promise you, even today, mm -hmm. think about maybe like, you know, the hardcore football fans that you know. It is Sunday. Mm -hmm. They watch the 12 o'clock game, the 3 o'clock game, and then another game. I even forget where it starts. Let's say 8 o'clock. You know what, you spend watching football 12, 13 hours a day. But maybe the first game you love as a Texan. But that third game, do you really have to watch this? Yeah. Right? Maybe something else is going on there. Think about the guys who are sitting there with their jerseys on, right? And they're watching the game. What else might be going on there? You know what? Maybe they be insecure in their masculinity. Right? Maybe they say, like, you know, today I couldn't play anymore, but... When they watch this, what are they thinking about? What they've been doing? I'm surprised nobody said it, but they both, they also, like today, nowadays, you put money and gamble on the game. Of course, you might have money on the game, although it's illegal. But I think what you put it to, right? You're saying, you know what? I remember when I played, right? It's kind of, you reconnect yourself, right, to what you could do when you went famous. And that means right here, I think what this game tells us is that. It starts with the president, he captures the attention of the lead, but then, right, perhaps the parents, alumni, but also middle class folks, right, they now come in as well and they say, look, I might be able to play this, but that masculinity, right, I associate myself with it, connect myself to it by being a fan and by coming to those games as well. And as you will see, right, today we would call this trickling down. Eventually, the idea starts on top and eventually begins to shape, right, how men think about themselves quite dramatically. If you know football well, What's happened today? Is football just played by elite rich white people? No. 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 Right? It's probably like you know the most appealing game that you have in the United States. It's the most popular sport. And that means in some ways, right? Well, what is football a good example of what? What has happened here to this kind of masculinity? Trickle down, 
Correct. Right? In some ways, it has become very widespread. And so here, I think you think about this here, what you see is that that new sense of masculinity has spread. It has spread dramatically and has impacted a lot of people. And we can show it in different ways as well. Before class, right, Mr. Dorsey mentioned he was to buy a bicycle. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you the time, there was another way. How people also think about getting physically more fit. And indeed, the way to prove it is that we can show bicycle sales all of a sudden shoot up like crazy. And it's not like all of a sudden people have to get to work by bike, right? They have always been able to walk. Now you're trying those things, right? Become more fit, more fit as well. Bodybuilding also now becomes very popular. And look at this. You all know this guy, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger. And note, the man is on steroids. Any idea who he is? That is Eugene Sanko, an immigrant. And he was the first famous American bodybuilder. And now look at this. Compare the biceps. Steroids, natural. That's about the same, right? Here, chest, I would say, only wins, but quadriceps. Look at those legs. That's fairly similar, right? In some ways, you get a sense here that this guy probably devoted most of his life to bodybuilding, and as a natural bodybuilder, he was also pretty good at it. But that's one example. But now ask yourself, if this guy lifts weights and doesn't have to work, so how do you think he makes his money? Yes, okay, but how do you make the money showing off? Not yet, we don't have that yet. What did he do? Like, he would pay people, or people would pay him to like, touch his biceps and... <laughs> exactly, he would do shows. Think about today what you might call like a fair, right? Maybe like you know, a small town fair, people come out, they might bring some goods that they have, and they have shows as well. And he basically would offer a show in which he would come out in a cape. And you would have to pay money to watch him take off his cape, and then what you said is absolutely true. You could also, you were allowed to touch his muscle as well. Let me tell you, men and women alike went up and groped the guy like crazy. <laughs> and now ask yourself, think about this. You pay money to be allowed to touch another man's biceps. What does this tell you about this new sense of masculinity? If you're willing to pay to touch another man. <laughs> Answer the question. How important is it to you? Hint, hint, that is the leading Very question. Desirable. Right? You get the idea? I mean, you must be obsessed with this way of looking at this. We say, like, oh my god, I gotta touch this guy. Why am I gonna feel this? And I think here, that guy's career is a very good example for us, right? That basically now you see the sense of risk spreading quite dramatically into wide sections of the population, of course, as well. But now note, there's a second element that I haven't mentioned yet. That was equally important, but also reinforced for other people. That they had to get in shape. And remember, 1880s, 1890s, that is the period of mass immigration. You probably do know why in the Gilded Age, more immigrants came to this country than in the previous 50 years combined. And now think about this. There you are, let's say, in the harbor of New York, right? And you are pushing a stroller with your wife and that baby. And a ship comes in of immigrants from Italy. And you know what those guys have been doing until about two months ago? Yes. And when they walk past you, what do you see? <laughs> Oops. These guys are all a whole lot taller and a whole lot stronger than me. And let me tell you, that scared Americans. Remember at this point in time, many Americans believe in social Darwinism, right? They had this idea that different groups in society always fight for power. Well, if you are there with your belly, looking at those guys coming in and they're all bigger than you, stronger than you, and you feel perhaps also tough than you, what worry did that create among many Americans? Fear. Fear of what? Right? That these guys basically might be stronger than you are, and eventually then, of course, would take over the country. And that meant actually now you had organizations being started who said we have to find a way to basically make sure the immigrants don't take over. And you know what their solution was? Physical fitness. And you know for what purpose? What do strong men do? Lots of babies. <laughs> the idea is, right, you now basically had fitness being promoted because you said that, you know what, 
every white American woman should have at least four children. Because if we have that many babies, our numbers will always be higher than those of the immigrants. And who makes a lot of babies? Strong, masculine men. And that means here, right? You now see here two things coming together. Right? One, the idea of aggression, bravado, strength, maybe for purposes of war, as they were the Roosevelt. But also you have fears, right? Fears about change society as well. And how some are right in this case here, toughening up men, getting them more strong, more masculine, might be sold more children. And how that combined them, right? So that many Americans to basically assume that yes, indeed, there was a very different way of how you use a new masculinity that will place the old. Let me stop it here before, before I go and turn this around and ask you about the old one. Any questions that you have so far? Well, then what did this replace? Let's say if you would have been in the 1830s or 40s, and you're a man you're going up to your dad and say, Dad, I want to play a sport. In all likelihood, regardless of what race you are, what background you have, what would your dad have told you? Okay, that doesn't exist yet. But even if it's a different game, what would your dad have told you? Waste of time. Yes, you are wasting your time. Right? Maybe running around in the yard and playing with a ball is fun for a kid. But you know what? What are you supposed to do as a man? What makes you manly? Work, make money, right? Get a job. That is the definition. It doesn't matter like, you know, if you're rich or if you're poor, if you're white, if you're black, if you're Asian, if you're Hispanic, it doesn't matter. Right? The idea is you provide. And here in this case, that's the older deal. And the older deal was, in some ways, are now possible, right? That men and women should have separate roles to complement, right? He works, she runs the house. He might help society through an association, she raises the kids, right? Also, of course, not about bisexuality. The exact same thing, right? For men, they are seen as very sexual beings. For women, oftentimes, find something they don't like, but they have some kids. Hence, the sexual double standard. For men, it's okay to do stuff outside of marriage. For women, absolutely not. Right? Even sexuality was something that was oftentimes lived separately in this time period as well. Now, of course, note here that that, in some ways, oftentimes might take money. Right? If you work in the factories and you are so poor, even your kids are working, you know what? You might dream of having your wife at home right? and say, I would like to protect you from this 10 years' work. But you probably can't do it. But the idea most certainly is thereby, even people financially can afford to do this. Now, what happened to this? Where is it Two things. First one here is that you had a new definition coming out that you know what? Look, obviously, being employed is important, but it's not what makes you manly. Right? That's an economic thing. What makes you manly is being physical in shape, athletic, bravado. Those are the key qualities that a true man has. And that meant the old idea it didn't go totally away, right? But it didn't become the most important thing anymore. And if you think about this, imagine then maybe if you think back to high school and you ask your male classmates, what makes you a man? What do you think they would have said? Not being a virgin. Good, right? In this case, no, but think about this. It's right here, right? Sexual prowess, right? Being out there with lots of girls. That is considered manly. What else? What else makes you manly? Does being on the football team make you manly? Yeah. yeah. Sitting in the library? No. Working for your job? <laughs> Not so much, right? And in some ways, well, so what do you see here? What has happened here with these two ideals? Good, right? You see change of time. Probably that in some ways here, the 20th century ideal, right, is still enormously powerful. Among men, and I would argue among many men, but actually of many ages. How about the 19th century one, right? The idea of providing that that is very masculine. Is it still there? I think in some ways, yes, right? And there's a good example of this. Have you guys ever heard of the term deindustrialization? No matter what the time period, and basically you had a lot of factories in the United States, and eventually these manufacturing jobs, right, they disappeared. Oftentimes today, maybe China or India, right? There's somewhere else. And imagine like a one factory town. You had many of these small towns, and there was one employer. Mm -hmm. And you know what happened when this one employer packed up and went to China? Everybody in this town, male and female, was unemployed at the same time, right? And that means you know. You're not losing your job because you did anything wrong or because you were a bad worker. The company left. The 
Do you know what happened within about six months? There would be a wave of suicides. Mm. And do you know who would kill? Mm. And I'm going to say him or herself because otherwise I'll give you the answer. It is many men who would shoot themselves. Mm. And ask yourself, why are they killing themselves? Mm. Right? Because in some ways what they think of is their reason for existence. Being the breadwinner. That is what we take away from them, right? And note that probably your wife and your kids are off much worse when you are gone than when you're with your wife. That tells you most certainly this rule of being the provider is still there and it's still important, but probably not as much. And, well, now here's your turn. Start with what you have seen. So how do you? And again, here by you, I can say you talk about yourself or you can talk about your friends, people you know. How do men today define masculinity? What makes you men? Um, bravery. Mm -hmm. um, not really taking anyone's crap. You know, kind of standing up for yourself. Good. Yes. Like that goes in class, but one, one way I used to look at it is, you know, still, you know, being that, I guess you can say, the backbone of the family. Mm -hmm. Say, you know, I do need to provide for my wife, my kids. That kind of thing. Right. Well, you know it's important. Right? More the older ideal. How about the other one with you? What makes somebody manly? So, um, I, I kind of have an interesting uh, take. Mm -hmm. This is for, for me specifically. But to me, you know, like, uh, I am a football player. Mm -hmm. I'm in between schools and, like, you know, I think Gary can come here. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, like, the things that make you manly, like, you know, cars, guns, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But there is kind of like an undercurrent of like uh, not being uh, shapeable, like kind mm -hmm. of that unshapeable like where you can have friends with different backgrounds, you can you know work with people of different orientations, religions, and it doesn't affect who you are. It doesn't affect mm -hmm. you know that you're a Catholic or that you're white or whatever. Like you you can have friends and not be shook by other you know people's backgrounds. Kind of that thing of like um, like being secure in your identity mm -hmm. as a male. As a man, you know. And I think in some ways it's interesting because if you think about football today, right? Mm -hmm. The people who play the game, I think, probably fairly diverse. Yeah. You have people probably of most egg backgrounds. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, probably might be Asian Americans might be one exception. I think you wouldn't find too many Asians that can play football. But otherwise, right, the reality is every there in note, you have people from poor neighborhood, you have people from very expensive private schools, right? Who are playing as well. And that means for what happens here. When you throw all these people in the mix, right? Well, you would think the differences would outweigh the similarities. But what is it that everybody is in common plays football? What is it this identity you mentioned, right? That you all share. And what is it? Correct. Right? You see what I'm getting? Yeah. So I think actually your case, I think, very nicely. Sure, sorry, because I think, I mean, you didn't put it this way. But if you go back to the 20th century, right? People talked about being stored, being stealed by a storm, right? I mean, oftentimes they went more by this, right? That if you show your brain in war, you become a real man by this. I think in some ways, right, an element of this might be proportional, right? That you go through, like, you know, obstacles together, <coughs> challenges together, and that brings out, right, you being a real man as well. I, I think do. that connects quite nicely, right, to this new definition of masculinity as well. Huh? Like, like some, in addition to that, like during the uh, 19th and the 20th century, like the change shift, uh, British officers, like military officers from World War One to World War II, begin to like they're upper class guys generally. They begin to adopt a uh, almost an insane sense of uh, calmness. You know, like Brit there's there's a term joke about British officers not knowing how to duck. Mm -hmm. It's like my knees don't bend. I don't crawl on the ground like one of you. You know. Poor soldiers, you know, I, I stand straight up and lead from the front like a real man. And you will see you actually saw this in battle. I mean, early on, we probably have machine gun. Mm -hmm. You know, soldiers would actually stand usually like this in battle. And you think, right, something shoots at you, that might be a smarter move, right? Decrease the amount of space you offer the person to hit you. But they actually stand like this. Mm -hmm. right? Again, show you manliness in battle, but not even taking cover. Mm -hmm. But note yourself manliness, you probably want to live. Yeah. Right? Is there an issue here that you see? I think the British care more about the manliness than the <laughs> Yes. Long, I can't be lost. But see, I would probably argue from my perspective Most right, of them, yeah. that you should put a question mark behind this. Yeah. Right? 
And so I think if we look at the cinnamon, I think you see now that oftentimes today I would say why I think the providing example is not totally gone. Indeed, oftentimes why if we ask students, for instance, right, who leave college after one semester, you know what they oftentimes say why they go? They say something like, I want to help out my family. You know, maybe something happened, you feel like, you know what, we need more, more income. And that means I think the sense of providing, it most certainly is still there. But ask yourself, can those two things actually today come to conflict? Yes. Good. Give me an example. Yes, well, certainly, like, for one, taking time out of your uh, schooling to, like, mm -hmm. take, take care of family and slow down your progress, your classes. Um, I can imagine for some gentlemen, uh, having a family or starting a family early a lot of time, like, before they completed college, can result in them assuming the role of a uh, provider, meaning they have to work full time. Maybe they give up the going to college or moving on because they have, they feel like they have a responsibility to make sure they take care of their family. Right. In some ways, two things. The first thing I think you mentioned is that the idea, the idea of being a provider can actually in some ways find limit what you do in education, right? If you say that my key responsibility is to help out, but well, then you want to help out right away. But if you would go to college, right, in the long run, you probably would have later on at a higher income and be able to help out even more. Mm -hmm. Because the need is so strong to help right away, right? You don't take the step. And that means actually here in the long run, this need to provide can actually limit how much you can do. And I think that would be a problem here. Just, I mean, I imagine most of them are quite sensitive to student calls and you know, debt needs or to falling short, you know, taking care of those responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Great. Huh. Anybody else? Think about this. Is there an issue with the masculinity that is defined as, say, mostly by aggression, bravado, strength? Is there an issue with that? Mm -hmm. I, would, I like to say this. I think, for me, I think um, we have been. I guess um, programmed to fall in uh, fall in a category, I guess, mm -hmm. and that's something I I def, like. I've heard my friends and my dad said their dads have said if they fell down and they cried, they would say something like, "Be a man, don't cry, whatever." But I think and my dad never told me that. But I think we fall into okay. This is the definition of a real man. This is a man. So I say sometimes I think we don't think for ourselves. So I feel like. We let society dictate what category we're going to go in, and I don't worry about category. I just go where I go. But I don't know if that's right for everybody, but it's right for me. Mm -hmm. So my thing is, when you say even define masculinity, it's, it's whatever I think it should be for me. And see, <laughs> that's where this is going, right? See where it says here, upsides, downside. I think one answer to this is the question as well, should there actually be one sort of standard definition? Of masculinity that most people follow. No. Good. I mean, there, I, if you if you take a large number of people, you're generally you're going to get similarities between them. But we're seeing everybody. Like there are some people who, in their families, they can make they can have a separate career as well, and it, and it works for them. Um, other ones that both people need to be working or um, or uh, something else. But there there should be. We should expect patterns, but we should allow for variation based on individual needs. Absolutely. Well, think about maybe your friends in high school. Do you know somebody who thought maybe spent too much time for sports and not entire time with the books? Okay, right. And now looking back at this, what is your response to this? I wish I was. I, I did more half and half. Huh? I would have loved to have studied more. And you don't have to answer this. But why do you think you did that? Looking back now, how would you answer that? Mm. Right? What was the draw to the aesthetic stuff, but not to the books? You get the idea? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Over here. Coming from a high school basketball player, the one thing that I would say would you were more focused on is, let's say, when you were like I said, when I played high, basketball in high school, mm -hmm. I was more focused on, you know, colleges looking at me and, and, you know, all the other things that have to do with basketball more more than I was, you know, playing 
for not playing for my high school, but focusing on what I had to do in high school. Okay. Anybody else? And the thing is, I would actually be interested in what both of you have to say, because I think age wise, right? You have a bit of difference here. I would like to see variation here as well. I would think playing sports would be looked at as just a regular accomplishment coming from a high school team. It's just more masculine, it gets you more girls. Girls don't care too much about the bang and A's and mm -hmm. stuff. They, they basically, you know, see, they, they can see your accomplishments in sports, mm -hmm. whereas Making A's in, in school is kind of a selfish thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. How about you? What would you say? Oh, well, hey, just what I said I, from my son, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, he tried swimming, but uh, he didn't care too much about school work. He was yeah. more on football because the girls were, you know, much more concerned with how, you know, mm -hmm. the, the physical. So, note hinting, I mean, I. For reasons of time, I didn't get into the idea of like how to the women, right? But note, in some ways, this issue of masculinity, it trickled down about men, right? But what else is done? It not necessarily has impacted every woman, right? But most certainly, there are also many women who have accepted this ideal as well. And I think that's a thing you notice here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's kind of funny you said that in my previous school, you know, like we just put down the girls, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, it was all fun and games, but you wouldn't even think about classwork until there were pretty girls in that class. Okay, yes. And then it was like, mm -hmm. okay, now we got to study and so on. Uh, it's just that perception of mm -hmm. perfection. Yeah, <laughs> good. And so if you look at this now, and I've gotten the five minutes, I guess. So I think you can find a way to wrap this up. And I think here, this is a good one here. Right? And yeah, in fact, you know, think about upside and down life here. <laughs> Do you think that we need maybe like a new definition of masculinity? Is this something that we should work on or not? Well, I can say it, it's sort of difficult because we went through a period where, um, recently, where to make ends meet, Americans, well, most Americans have to work more and more hours mm -hmm. at their jobs. Wages are no longer increasing, like real, like really increasing. So. Very few people have time. Very, like fewer people have time to engage in body scope, the uh, slow thing. Mm -hmm. You know, to maintain this uh, masculine image of phys like just pure physicality, rather than the old masculine image of just uh, familial uh, dedication and like mm -hmm. you know, um, it's it's difficult. I mean, obviously the wages and you know the. Uh, Employment thing is its own problem, but masculinity, well, what's expected of us is not helping, I think. Okay, so you would say there's an impasse there, but maybe you don't see a solution yet? How are you, Dave? I kind of, I'm kind of, take what's your name, man? Trevor. I'm kind of piggyback on Trevor for a, a second. The way I look at it is, you know, yes, we have to, you know, focus somewhat on, you know, body sculpting or whatever. But the way I look at it is it's kind of half and half. You have to, uh, you have to, you know, worry about making yourself look good. Mm -hmm. But you also have to think about, you know, you being the backbone of the family, like I said earlier, making money for your family, doing everything so, you know, you, you, your wife, your kids, whatever, can live right. But I think there, to, in today's world, we would need to, we need to find some sort of uh, I guess you could say midway point. Okay. Yeah. I think I give you the last word because we're almost out of time. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I feel like uh, as a whole, like as men in our society, we'd be more supportive of, uh, of each other. Mm -hmm. You know, because each one of us has different strengths and weaknesses. And kind of the thing is like, not everyone can be this giant, tall, you know, bodybuilding, masculine person. We kind of have to like support each other. And like, if you have, if someone's an accountant, you know, it's like, Brother, like, go get it. Go mm -hmm. get your stuff. Or someone, you know, a used car salesman. It's like, all right, bro, like, that's your, that's your hustle. Like, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more a thing of pick yourself up to be the best version of you. Because that's what your family needs. You know, like, like, like what boys over here are saying, you know, you need to be the backbone. You need to be superior. You need to be unshakable. And that's really what it's about, is that you got to be the guy where it's like, this is just crazy. You mm -hmm. know, crazy. So it's kind of like teams, like, support each other, like, build that kind of unshakable, 
you know, identity of yourself, whatever that may be. Okay, then I think with that, let me thank you all for coming out. Uh, so we have this discussion today about why, how masculinity has changed over time. And if you guys have time, right, come back, come to Mansur, and continue on with the discussion.